Tonight's program, as you know, will deal with the town of Greenberg's revaluation process, how it affects you, your complex, your board. We have two speakers. Our first speaker is Daniel Finger. Daniel, of course, is an attorney with Finger and Finger, a professional corporation, a firm, which serves as chief counsel to the CCAC and its parent organization, the BRI, is based here in White Plains. Dan, of course, is no stranger to our membership. He has spoken on various topics before our associations. He also serves as a key contact to our membership on various issues affecting the CCAC, the BRI, and its affiliate association, the Apartment Owners Advisory Council. Dan has been following these revaluation scenarios involving the reval processes in our region for several years now. His firm has represented the BRI and the Building and Realty Institute, the Building and Realty Industry, I should say, during those processes by evaluating what's been happening at those hearings and stressing the point of view of the realty industry. At this point, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Daniel Finger. So I'm gonna start out by giving a little overview on the process uh, in general, on um, what, what's going on in the town of Greenberg, as well as things that they're considering, specifically the homestead exemption, and uh, or the home, better known as the homestead tax option. And then uh, Kevin Schick is gonna speak after me. Kevin is an appraiser. And so I'm just gonna ask that any questions be held till the end, because I think uh, between the two of us, a lot of the questions will be answered um, you know, before we get to them. I'm sure there'll still be questions, but I think it'll be easier that way. Let's see if this works. Ah, there we go. So first, just to the basics, what is a reassessment? So a reassessment is when um, the town decides to look at all of the different uh, parcels, properties, condominium units, cooperatives, every you know whether commercial, residential, everything in the community, and make sure that the values are adjusted. It, this arises because for a lot of communities in Westchester, they don't do complete revaluations for a very long time, so the numbers get skewed. And they, so it, it's, you know, you have situations where certain properties are worth more than what their assessment are, certain are worth less. Uh, so they're going around to all the different parcels, they're doing an analysis of all of the values and the taxes and they're trying to make sure everybody's assessed fairly, and part of this process is they are uh, going to a system where the assessment is equal to 100% of market value. So for a single family home, if the home was worth $500,000, that's what the assessment would be. Um, okay, They've, this has already been done in a number of different communities in Westchester. Pelham was one of the first, uh, Rye, Bronxville, Mamaroneck, Scarsdale. Right now, Greenberg, Ossining, North Salem, and Yonkers are all um, going on right now. They are all being done um, together. They, they uh, basically collectively, collectively bargained with the company that's supervising it, which is called Tyler Technologies. Um, they're the ones that are going around and collecting all the data and information. Um, and now we go to the next uh, thing. So the, the main thing that Tyler Technologies is doing right now is they're going around to all the um, all the lots and all the condominium units and all the co-ops, and they're going around to every parcel in Greenberg, and they're collecting data um, to do their analysis. And part of that is uh, with condominiums and co-ops, looking at the offering plans, looking at all, all the you know the financials, the income, the expenses, every every bit of information they can get to try to help them when they go to determine what the values are gonna be. Um, and I, I couldn't get this as part of my thing, but I have, I, some of you may have already gotten a letter from Tyler Technologies telling you that they're gonna come out to your, to your unit or your property. Um, it, it looks something like this, if anybody really cares, I can show you afterwards, but um, in any event, that, that's the first step with them telling you that they're gonna do their actual property inspection. Okay, so these are some of the uh, things that they consider when they're doing their um, inspection and, and trying to find information for the value. They look at 
the year that, that the property was built, the overall condition, design, quality of construction is a big one, um, square footage, uh, you know, those you can see those are some of them, a um, lot of different considerations, but all the they're basically looking at all the different items and all the different things uh, that differentiate one property from another and contribute to the value of a property. It's important to note that you do not have to let the inspector inside of your house, the, the data collector. You don't have to let them in. They are still going to do an outside. They still will walk around the property. They'll, you know, for condominiums and co-ops, they'll look at the offering plan. They'll get information that way. Um, but you're not required to let them inside. If you don't let them inside, they're going to estimate the interior characteristics and uh, based on the information that they have available, and they will also look at similar units that they have been able to gain access to, and they will assume that your unit has a similar condition in terms of quality of construction, design, finish, et cetera, as whatever units they are able to get into. So um, what I've been told is that they're gonna assume if it's a, you know, if all they see is units that have a mid-grade construction or, you know, or, or, are, or haven't been renovated in 25 years or something like that, they tell me that they're going to assume that that's, you know, that any that they haven't got into are the same. I, myself, am a little bit of a skeptic and I'm not quite sure I believe that and I tend to think that they're going to assume that any unit that they didn't get into has been renovated and is of a good quality of construction. Um, so, you know, there's not really an answer that, that I can give you as far as should you let them in or not, um, because I just don't know exactly what the truth is. So, um, you know, if you don't let them in, you run the risk that they're going to think that your unit is of a better condition than it is, um, you know, and especially if they are able to gain access to another unit that's been renovated, then they certainly are going to assume that yours has been renovated. Um, the, after they've done all their data collection, uh, they're going to send out a data mailer. Again, I had a sample that I couldn't get on my, um, on my slideshow, but it, it looks something like this. Um, it has all of the information and you can correct it and you know, go through and, and make notes. You, you have that opportunity and it's important you do that because when you get the, the mailer, it, it describes all the different things about your, you know, about your unit or about your property. How many units, the style, approximate year built, um, you know, other things too, the HVAC system, everything, you know, square footage, everything about your property or your unit. And this is your opportunity to correct any mistakes they made. And they're, they're doing every unit in Greenberg. So they're going to make mistakes. They're not, they're not perfect. So it's important that you look through that, um, that mailer and you make sure that if they made any mistakes, you correct it. They could have the square footage wrong. They could have, you know, there could be a lot of things. They could have that, that your kitchen was refinished when it wasn't. Um, you know, it could be any number of things. But it's important that you correct that because if you don't correct it, that's going to go to the value of your unit. So they're going to use that in, in um, calculating what they believe the unit is valued at. Um, now, some of this is getting ahead because it might not matter if they don't adopt Homestead, but if they do, it, it, it may still matter. If they do adopt Homestead, it'll matter more. Um, it, it still could, there's still ways that it could be, um, you know, used and looked at. So it's important that when you get that, that you correct it, that you make sure that everything is correct. If it's not, send it back. They may want to come out again and look at your property again to verify that you're telling them the truth, but, or they may just want to talk to you on the phone. Um, either way, it's still important that you don't ignore it. Uh, the final valuation, so once they have all of the uh, information for every parcel in Greenberg, they're going to use all that, they're going to do an analysis, and they're basically going to compare every property to every other property and come up with what they think the values are. Um, and they're going to send a notice to everybody telling them what your old value was and then what your new, what your new value is. And for condominium units, there's going to be an additional number on the notice that you get it's going to show not only what your old value was and what your new value is, but it's also going to show your new value if they don't adopt the homestead tax option and your new value if they do adopt the homestead tax option. So you'll be able to see the difference in the assessment right there. Um, and the other um, important point of this is regardless of what it shows, 
you can still, um, you'll still have the right to grieve it. it. It doesn't eliminate the grievance process. If you disagree with the value they came up with, you can still grieve it. If, it's, if they don't elect the homestead option, then the process doesn't change at all. Um, and either way, and especially for co-ops, same thing, they'll get the, you know, you'll get the number, the co-op will get the number, and um, <laughs> if they disagree with it, they can grieve it. And we were talking earlier, and one of the interesting things in some of the other places um, is that they, there's, there's certain aspects of the grievance process in terms of you may have just settled, uh, but they're not, you know, because they're going through this, they're not bound anymore to hold your assessment at any level for any period of time. So um, it's one of the quirks by the fact that they're doing this revaluation. The, I'm going to skim over this a little bit because this is really where Kevin will give a, a um, better explanation of this than I will, but there's basically two methods of valuation, um, and this has to do, with, uh, which is what I was kind of talking to about whether or not they adopt the homestead tax option. The first is the income approach, which is, applies to commercial properties. That's what co-ops and condos use now. Um, it is significantly to your advantage to be valued under that approach. Even if there was, even if the tax rate is higher or whatever, it's still to your advantage because the the method that they're using, they're estimating the value based on the net income of the property. So there's a lot of factors in there. Kevin is going to go into this in detail, so I won't touch on it too much. But um, it, they use that to calculate an assessment. The market value approach, which is also the sales approach, this is normally used for residential properties. If they adopt the homestead tax option, condominiums that were built as condominiums would then um, be converted to use the market value approach, which is not to your advantage. Um, it basically means that they're taking what the value on the market is, what the house could or the unit could sell for, and that becomes the assessment. If you were to lump all those together, that would, for the whole building, that would be higher than whatever the total assessment would be under the income approach. Um, so if they, if they decide to use the homestead option, it's not because it would be to your benefit. Um, so now, going into the homestead option, tax option a little bit, which I think is really the reason why most of us are interested and are here, um, the homestead option establishes two separate property tax rates, a residential or homestead rate, and a rate for all the other properties, the non-homestead properties or commercial properties. Typically, the homestead rate is usually lower than the non-homestead, and the other part of this is that if they adopt it, they can freeze the homestead, the shares for each of the classes based on whatever the shares of the properties were for the year before the new assessments were used. So in other words, they can, if the residential portion in the year before the assessment made up, say, 60% of the total value of the town, but after the revaluation, the residential portion was 80% of the total value, they can freeze the residential portion at the 60%, even though they're now 80%. So it means that the 20% of commercial would now have to pay for 80%, or, sorry, for 40% of the budget instead of their 20% of the budget. Um, so it's, just, it's, it's one of the quirks. And even putting the condominiums in the residential, even with that, the difference is not usually that much, so it still wouldn't be to your benefit. The, the homestead tax option, it, it's, it's decided by the town board. So the Greenberg town board is the one that will decide this. They're going to decide this probably next, I, I think next March, April, possibly February, but I think it's somewhere in there. Um, they're doing all the inspections right now. They're going to have the valuations sometime around the beginning of the year is when they'll get out the letters with whatever the new valuations for everybody are. And then after they have that information, they get that out. Um, that's when they'll make the decision. Somebody mentioned to me tonight that they heard that the, that the town had already said they weren't going to do it. I find that hard to believe because I, I've heard from the assessor that they're talking about it, that, you know, that, and I know they still... Um, you know, it's, I, I, they, they are not even allowed to decide yet, so I, I know that they can't just, you know, say right now that it's, you know, that they're not going to do it. Um, the homestead tax option, it would, it would qualify or classify all uh, one, two, three family residential homes and any condominiums that were built as condominiums, not conversions, they would now be qualified as residential, so they would be taxed again using that market value. Um, the, now, the school district is another um, aspect of this. If the school district is entirely in, in one town, 
that elects to use the homestead tax option, then the school district has to use um, the homestead tax option. But they can opt out of it by passing a resolution. So the school board would pass a resolution and then they could opt out of it. Um, it it's going to be, that's another thing that if Greenberg decides to do it, it's going to be interesting because obviously there's many different school districts within the town of Greenberg. Um, so there's going to be decisions for those school districts to make as well, um, especially some of them where they're not entirely in the town of Greenberg, which gets to my next uh, slide, which is that um, if a school district is in more than one town and more than one fifth of the prop, then, then in that case, more than one fifth of the properties must be in the town um, with the homestead tax in order for them to use it. And then in that event, the um, the determination of the of the class shares of how they're dividing it up is based on current market value, and the the school board, the school district, can make adjustments to that. Um, Villages, again, something else that's going to apply to Greenberg, because there's obviously many villages in Greenberg. Um, so villages can adopt homestead if it's, if it's entirely contained within a town, which I think everyone in Greenberg is, but um, they can adopt homestead by passing a local law if, they've, if they give up, if they've given up their assessing unit status. So if, they, if the village itself is not doing any assessments, then they can give up, um, they, and, or they give up that ability then they can adopt the homestead um, also. Um, the, they can al also, if they're a wholly, a wholly contained village, they can adopt it by doing a reassessment themselves and becoming an approved assessment, assessing unit. I, I would be a little surprised if they went that route because I think it would be easier since the revaluation would have already just been done for them to go the first route if they were going to do that. But, um, and the last point on this slide, which is not really applied to Greenberg, is that villages that are located in more than one town um, could give up their assessing unit and adopt Homestead if more than 20% of its parcels were in an approved assessing unit that adopted Homestead. Okay. Um, now, I've mentioned a lot of this already, but condominiums that are built as condominiums would be reclassified as Homestead properties. Um, and again, the method for calculating the assessments would be to would, would switch from the income approach to the market value approach. And again, I can't stress this enough, the assessments, if they did that, would, would increase and the taxes would most likely increase. If your assessment goes up, you're, then the share that you're paying of the taxes would also go up. Obviously, if the town decided to drastically reduce the amount of money they needed, then you, know, then you wouldn't be paying as much taxes, but proportionately, it's still gonna go up. Um, these are some of the factors that, that towns typically consider uh, when they're adopting homestead, they, they, or at least that they should consider. Um, the tax shift from the commercial to the residential class, the impact on property values, this is going to have, and again, Kevin will speak a little bit more on this, but if they were to adopt homestead, the property values of condominium units would be impacted. If your taxes go up, your, your property value is going to go down. You know, people have a certain amount of money each month that they can afford to pay for their home, and you know they can divide that up between their mortgage, their taxes. If your tax portion goes up, then the amount that you have left over to spend on your mortgage is going to go down. So um, there is an impact on that. Um, one of the factors that I always uh, try to stress in these situations that I'm not always certain how much is heard is that there are a lot of things that condominiums are responsible for the single family homeowners are not responsible for. A lot of, especially as built condominiums, a lot of them have their own internal roads that they're maintaining, that they're plowing, they're salting in the winter, um, street lamps to, you know, to keep those roads safe. Um, you know, trash pickup might be, might be different. You know, you have to pay something for your, you know, extra for your trash. Um, I mean, you know, there, there's a number of different factors like that, that single family homeowners aren't paying that condominium owners are paying. And what's usually stressed um, by the single family homeowners who want homestead or you know, people in favor of it is they say, well, why should a, why should a single family home that's worth $500,000 be paying more taxes than a condominium unit that, that's worth $500,000? And I mean, there's obviously a philosophical 
um, aspect to that in terms of, well, you know, condominium unit owners, that's part of what makes a condominium a condominium. That's why people, you know, bought, it's one of the factors when people bought the unit. But it's also that there's, I believe anyway, that there's a big element that there's services that condominium unit owners aren't getting from the, from the town or village or municipality that single family homeowners are getting. Um, the town should also consider what the village and school boards are going to do, how that's all going to play out. It also would have extra work, that, you know, that would add extra work for the assessor's office. I, I don't know how much the assessors really care about that, but, um, and they would have to manage different tax levels and a different tax rate. And, and also there's always the argument that on the business community, um, when the businesses are responsible for a higher share of taxes, it's going to impact that those business communities, the businesses and the business development and, and you know, and it may have a negative impact in, in that regard. Um, and in general, they should consider what's best for all the residents and commercial property owners. Um, some misconceptions. Um, a, a lot of times I've heard people say, well, my taxes will increase. It's not necessarily true. Um, your taxes, usually in a revaluation, putting aside the condominium, you know, single family home aspect, usually some people's assessments go up, some people's assessments go down, some people stay the same. That's typically how it works. Um, and so some people's taxes, if their assessment goes up, then, then their taxes are going to go up. But it's not, you know, it's not directly that because they're doing a reassessment, your taxes are going to go up. Some people's, it does happen that they go down. Um, some people also are afraid that their school districts are going to receive um, less state aid. That is, that is, as far as I know, not the case. There's a number of different factors, and, and they don't directly use um, these numbers to determine that. So... Um, that's usually not the case. They, the, the state uses its own numbers and places its own values on the value of a community. Um, the town collects more taxes after it does a reassessment. That's not true. The town board, it's completely separate from the reassessment. Every year the town board does its budget. They decide how much money they need to operate the town. And then uh, that's what determines what people's taxes are. It's people pay their proportionate share of whatever the town determines um, about the budget. The county taxes would not really, uh, as far as I know, the county taxes would not be affected by this. Um, it would be a separate process, which the county hasn't done. Um, and the, the next steps are when the municipalities um, undergo this process, they can make annual adjustments to the um, shares that are determined in the revaluation. They can revoke the homestead tax option at any time. Um, and they can, in, they can institute it any time they do a complete revaluation. Typically, every four or five years, they do a revaluation. They can make some adjustments every year. Um, but it, it, usually, they, do, they continue to do it, because otherwise, they would no longer be at the 100%. And then they would have wasted all the money that they just spent doing this big revaluation if they didn't try to keep it up to date. Um, so they, you know, it's to their benefit for a number of reasons to keep current and to keep it at 100%. Um, there are just some of the resources. The town of Greenberg's website has a link to, uh, actually to the Tyler Technologies website, where they have a lot of information about the, um, the process, about when they're going around to the different areas, um, and a lot of that information. There's also a lot of information on New York State's website. Um, so anybody that, that you know, wants those websites, I can get them to them. But, um, but the town of Greenberg's website does point to Tyler Technologies, and they have a, they have a specific page for them with, that has a great deal of information about this. Um, and I think that's all I have. So Thank with you. that, let's turn it over to Kevin. Thanks, Daniel. Well, this is their first time doing it in Greenberg, because as far as I know, it's been a very long time since Greenberg's done a complete revaluation. Okay. Um, but they've done this for a lot of communities. In our area? They're doing, I'm not sure how many are area, but they're doing all four of the ones in Greenberg, Yonkers, Austin, and North Salem. They collectively bargained with Tyler, so Tyler's doing all four of those communities right now. Oops. I can't Our next speaker is Kevin Schick. Kevin is the Director of Tax Certiori Appraisal at McGrath & Company, which has offices in Bedford and Fishkill. 
McGrath & Company is known for its work as real estate appraisers and counselors. Kevin is a New York State certified general real estate appraiser. He has appraised commercial properties of all types since 2003. Prior to his career in real estate, he worked in the mergers and acquisitions department at Daimler Chrysler in Stuttgart, Germany. Kevin's firm has more than 40 years of experience appraising properties for tax tertiary purposes and has been correctly and has been correcting inequities and assessments for co-op apartment buildings and condominium developments since the mid-1970s. Kevin has completed several hundred appraisals for this purpose that have returned millions of dollars in overpaid taxes to owners of every type of commercial and residential property. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Schick. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. You'll have to forgive me. Uh, the last time I spoke to this many people was at my brother's wedding, and I had some uh, liquid courage then, so you have to excuse me. But So I'm Kevin Schick. Uh, my firm specializes in this type of appraisal. We, we do all types of appraisals for mortgages, for estates, but the main focus of our business is tax tertiary appraisals, and that's, that's a wonderful gift from the New York State. And that's <laughs> because we live in this state. Um, there's certain things that are unique about our tax system, one of which is the fact that condos and co-ops are assessed as if they were hypothetically rental apartment buildings. Um, so this is, this is an excerpt of the law. This is Section 339Y, and that's also there's a duplicate section of 581A of the Real Property Tax Law that basically sta states this. That, and this goes back to the uh, 70s and early 80s when a lot of the co-ops were being converted and it was a way of it was a way of making sure that the uh, real estate tax burden on new co-op owners wasn't based on sale prices to you know basically undermine the values that they had just just paid for their units so what I did was I took an excerpt from a recent appraisal that I had done on a condominium in Irvington this was a small unit this was a small property it was only 13 units but what we do is we we project income based on the attributes of each individual unit. So for we don't take into consideration HOA fees or dues or anything. We, we ignore that. We hypothetically treat it as if it were operated as a rental apartment building for profit. So we take into consideration all these things. So you'll see on this, each one of the units is different. Um, that's not typically the case, but on this one it was. Uh, <clears throat> I look at, uh, we get rental information from MLS, and also because we've done so many of these, we have a vast library of comparable rents that have been charged that may not be public information. Also, one of the benefits of my firm having done this for so long is we were actually involved in the, in the conversion process back in the 70s and 80s, not me, but my boss. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have, a, we have a large library of cooperative offering plans that used to take up five or six filing cabinets and now fits in the size of that thumb drive so it's a uh, pretty it's a benefit we have over other over other firms uh, just the history I have going back so far so what we do is we project so I look at the attributes of each individual unit and I try to establish I try to ascertain from the market what that unit would rent for were it to be rented on the open market sometimes there um, there are specific examples at each individual property where a unit owner does rent it so I'm able to I'm able to look at those units and kind of extrapolate some, some things and so I can use that rent to apply to other units within that building itself. I also consider nearby properties that have similar uh, physical attributes and services, you know, like uh, in-unit laundry, similar uh, layouts, similar sizes, uh, room counts. Obviously, I'm not going to compare a one-bedroom to a five-bedroom, not that there's many of those out there. but. So we so this these are so on this particular property we had 12 units and we had one office co uh, condominium unit, and what I take into account is you know fireplaces, uh, the layout is it open or is it is it like some older cooperative buildings that you know are kind of closed off and uh, were built in an old style back in the 20s and 30s, um, and then I apply these rents to each individual unit to come up at uh, what's called the potential gross income, which is the maximum amount of income any property could generate. That's potential gross income or PGI. From PGI, what we do is we take a vacancy loss. Um, typically, I use 5%. In some neighborhoods, I, I'll use 
less uh, because there's such a high, de high demand for housing. So, for instance, if, if your cooperative is adjacent to the Hartsdale train station, there's going to be a much more demand for that type of rental space for people commuting into the city. Or if, it's, uh, if it has great highway access or it's in close proximity to uh, the Platinum Mile where a lot of people work. You know, people want proximity to these kind of major, um, major drivers of, uh, of rents. So then what we do is, from the, uh, from the potential gross income, we subtract vacancy and we get the effective gross income, or EGI. From the EGI, we subtract typical operating expenses. I take into consideration the expenses that are actually incurred by the condo and co-op properties because the level of service provided in each one of those buildings is dependent on the um, expenses incurred. So, for instance, if you have a doorman, if you have a lot of uh, site area where, you know, it's like a park-like campus or something, there's costs involved and those costs have to be addressed in our analysis. So, uh, if, you're, if you're on a condominium building and, um, you know, you have tennis courts and pools and, you know, walking paths, all that stuff costs money to maintain and we reflect that in our estimate of stabilized expenses. An additional thing we do is since interior repairs aren't typically incurred by the condominium boards, we project that separately as a percentage of gross income. So that's where you see reserves for replacements. So that's for, that's for replacing um, dishwashers, for replacing uh, dryers, clothes washers, all, all, any appliance you can imagine. Um, the central furnace, uh, you know, air conditioners, all that sort of stuff. And then you see apartments painting and decorating. And that's for interior repairs that typically aren't incurred by the condominiums. Uh, they're incurred by the private uh, condominium owners. So, once we, once we come up with our net operating income, which is the bottom line there, we have to figure out how to convert that into, an, into, a, into a property value so we can establish what an assessment is. We do that through the use of what's called an effective tax rate. Basically what we figure out is, on the bottom line here, so this is in Irvington, Every year in Irvington, if you have, say, a million dollar home and the effective tax rate is 3.63%, that means you're paying $36,300 for in taxes total. So it's 3.63% of your total market value. What we do is we add this to what's called a capitalization rate, which you see, this is, a, this is my whole analysis here. The capitalization rate at the bottom we add the effective tax rate and then we divide the net operating income by this rate to reach a market value. Now the, the, the base capitalization rate, it's a measure of several things, but basically it's a way of converting an income stream into a value. And it's, uh, there's lots of things that go into it. The cost of money, risk perceived in that type of real estate, you know, whether or not there's any appreciation of market rents, you know, if they're expecting if you say you have a cooperative building and you're hypothetically treating it as a rental apartment, you know, are there ETPA units? If there's ETPA <coughs> units, then there's ways of increasing the, uh, the net operating income by uh, exploiting some MCIs. There's ways of increasing ETPA rents where you really can aggressively increase your net operating income by doing some things. And we reflect those things through a base capitalization rate. So if there's a lot of appreciation in the income stream, we would use a lower cap rate, but since since we're projecting market level rents for every type of unit, what's what we've seen recently, so if market level rents are increasing at 2% per year, we've been seeing expenses increase at 2.5% per year. So there is no real appreciation to the income stream, which is why we're using cap rates above 8%. Uh, a lot of assessors and Tyler Technologies, I'm sure, will be trying to apply uh, investment grade real estate cap rates to condominium and cooperative buildings in the 6% range. And when you do that, it grossly overstates value because there's just no appreciation in the income stream. There's, no, there's nothing you can really do to get more money out of these hypothetical rental apartment buildings. Okay? So then this is, this is the last step. This is where we combine, where we basically compare what I'm saying the assessment should be to what the assessment actually is. On this case, uh, on this particular property, it wasn't too far over assessed. 
but there's instances where it's 30, 40, 50 percent. You'd be, you'd be surprised how out of control these can get um, through years of uh, old assessments not being updated. And, you know, like Daniel said, I think when was the last time Greenberg did a reassessment was, I think, in the 60s. So what happens is, you know, you have an, you have an assessment that was established that long ago, and it's just no longer accurate because the way the state figures the market value is through the use of this equalization rate. So an equalization rate, when you divide the actual assessment by this rate, you get what the assessor thinks your market value is. And uh, when, when you're on this system, the state always, the state always overestimates the amount of appreciation in the market. And when they do that, it leads to inequities. So that's about it. I mean, it's, 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 fairly, it's a fairly simple process uh, of hypothetically treating it as a rental apartment building. It's just, it, it brings in a lot of elements. And there's many things you have to consider, um, specifically the types of units, their attributes, et cetera. And, uh, you know, but this is really just a typical analysis that I would do. And um, the problem is when you have Homestead and it's assessed on sale prices, typically the way it is now, uh, a, a unit would be assessed about half of what it would sell for. It's about 50%. That 50% ratio, if you're talking about, you know, it goes to a homestead option and now you have, a, you have the homestead tax rate, I don't think, at least in my experience, I haven't seen it where it actually benefited the property owner. It's always an increase uh, from what I've seen. And we've gone through several revals. We did Town of Rye, Pelham, Ameranek, Scarsdale, and it always seems to, they try to sell you one bill of goods and then it always ends up being exactly the opposite of what they originally said. So um, that's it. If, uh, if anybody has any questions for Daniel or I. Uh, in terms of the first phase where they're acquiring the data, right, and for the income approach, are they going to use the, for a, for a, a multiple family or whatever, they're going to use the information that was that was submitted to the uh, DHCR, or are they going to ask you to now prepare another p &L? I'm not sure if they have access. It's a good question. Um, I'm honestly not sure if they have access to the DHCR information. I am pretty sure that they are going to ask you to do a new p &L or a new, you know, or ask for other information. So. Okay, so then follow up question to either of you is how do you do the tax tertiary when they have the data? <coughs> they, they've got you. What data do they have specifically that you're talking well, about? Well, they're going to get the P&L. Yeah, but we give them that when, we're, when we file a grievance and when we file a petition in tax tertiary proceeding, we give them that information anyway. But just because we give them the information that we have and what we believe is the right information doesn't mean that they're going to come to the same interpretation <coughs> that somebody like Kevin would come. Kevin, you can explain. The, 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 the P&L that you're talking about is it's only useful for the expense side. They have to hypothetically treat these things as rental apartment buildings. So what your monthly dues or HOA fees are has nothing to do with the process. They have to derive from the market and establish market level rents for each one of your units. I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I'm projecting forward that they're going to do this process for apartment owners as right. well. And so for in that case, then I'm sure they're going to ask about the rentals. And if, and if right. you say no, they can get it from the DHCR. Again, so then how do you uh, protect? Is there a protection? that we can uh, call upon to, uh, or are we screwed? Well, are, you, are you specifically? Are you asking as an apartment owner, or are, you, are you asking, or are you asking as a condominium owner? Apartment owner. So, I mean, I think that the answer is that, I, again, it's, you know, it's the income and the expenses, but it's hard to project it forward because, um, you know, every year your income doesn't necessarily, necessarily stay the same. There's certain... Um, things that you consider that you might argue that, that as far as how your income is appreciating uh, versus how the town feels that your income is appreciating and how your expenses are growing. It's similar to with the Rent Guidelines Board and, you know, when, and the arguments that we have there where we're always arguing that we need bigger increases because 
the fuel is higher, the insurance is going up, and you know different things, you know, and all the different expenses that are that we have to factor in are increasing. And the town has the other point of view that well, it's not as bad as you think it is. The fuel was you know was not so bad last year, and the expenses are not so bad this year. I mean, so I don't know that you can necessarily use the numbers that we gave them this year, whether for income or expense, and be able to project out that that they're going to have that for next year. And either way, I mean, again, even when you're doing a certiorari for an apartment building, you know, as an, as a person who owns the whole apartment building, again, it's the same process as it would be for a co-op and a condo. You're still giving them that information when you're doing it, uh, when you're doing that certiorari anyway. So if they wanted to, they could use it when you had it and project it. I mean, they that's one of the inequities or unfairnesses of the whole tax certiorari process is we do our appraisal, we give them our information up front, uh, we give them our appraisal fairly early on, and they don't have to give us anything until if and when we decide that we're going to go to trial. So they always have the information, you know, long before we do, and they use their what they feel is the right cap rate and what they, you know, and 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 things like that to, you know, and they always like Kevin said, they argue that it should be lower, and we argue that the cap rate should be higher. You'd you'd be shocked at how bad their record retention is, really. It, it, it's yeah. <clears throat> Dan, you mentioned after the inspection that the, uh, I think you called it the uh, fact sheet or mm -hmm. whatever, uh, with the information of the unit inspection. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 you implied that it goes directly in a co-op to the unit owner and not to the property manager. How does that work? No, I think with the co-op, um, co I think it goes... Wait, I hope it goes to the manager. I think it does, but I'm, wait, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm not entirely sure what you're asking. Well, if it's a condo, you own a house, you get the fact sheet as an owner. Right, it's, di yeah, no, no, a co-op, it's not going, people. right, it's different with a co-op. Oh, okay. it's, yeah. So it doesn't go to the individual? No, it okay, doesn't go good. to the individual, yeah. <laughs> Valerie, At least as far as I know. Yeah. But. If they haven't done this since the 60s, which is a tad frightening to say the least, um, what... From what you've seen so far, can expectations around property taxes impact two to three percent, five percent? Well, the most recent revals were in Mamaroneck and Scarsdale, and um, they got the values really wrong. Um, there's there's instances of where there was an active tax tertiary, and uh, the town was willing to settle it up to 2012, and let's say they said. 2012, we agree, the value is worth $12 million. But then the reval numbers came out the next year, and they have it at $16 million. So obviously there's a big problem. Now, why is there that disconnect? I'm not really sure. And they have, it hasn't been, uh, they, they're, they're still refusing to acknowledge that there's over-assessments for the 2013 year. I think, I think there's, it's starting to open up where now Tyler Technologies is, or well, Tyler wasn't the reval company in that instance, but where the reval company is beginning to recognize that they got it very wrong. But why there's that disconnect, I really don't know. Uh, they, these mass appraisals, they do, you know, they're doing thousands of properties at the same time. So they're not using specific market data catered to each individual building, which they really should because mm -hmm. you have two buildings that are right next to one another and they could be drastically different. You know, the, 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 for instance, the unit mix in one building could be majority studios in one bedroom. And the, the, in the next building, it could be two and three bedrooms. And there's, there's no consistency between the two. So, uh, go ahead. Well, yeah. Um, we, we have a co-op, and it was a, a, a rental uh, prior to becoming a conversion okay. and a co-op. Um, and we have just had a certiorari uh, completed. Okay. Now, is all of that wiped out? That is all wiped out. That's one of the drawbacks of the, of the town-wide reval is that they, so typically when you settle a tax certiorari matter, there's a three-year holding period where they cannot touch your assessment, except if there's a reval. So that's so the money that we have been told we will be getting. No, no, oh, no, no. You'll, you'll get you that money. If you settled it, if no. you settled it, yeah. What, it, the years that you settled for that that's not wiped out. So in other words, if you were filing for two thousand 
2009 through 2014 and you settled and you agreed that for each of those years your value should be you know X Y Z whatever so therefore you were over assessed and you do a refund mm -hmm. and they calculate what the refund is that that's not touched you're still going to get that refund if okay. you settled it yeah. those years aren't affected because what's happening in this revaluation is they're picking a date the date they're picking I believe is July 2015 they are going to value everything as of July 2015. So they're calculating the values for each house, for each condominium unit, each co-op building, whatever, as of that date. And, you know, that's what it's going to be for them when they do the tax year, the rolls for next year. Everything that happened in the past isn't affected. So the values that you agreed on for 2014 that helped you arrive at what your over-assessment was, that's not affected. What happens is when you do that settlement, so if you settled in, say, 2014, yeah. then there's typically, a, what Ken was saying, there's a three-year hold period, statutory hold period, so that whatever number you agreed on is the value for the co-op for 2014, the town has to keep that value for 2015, 2016, 2017. Then after that, they'd be able to change it and whatever. When they're doing a town-wide reval, you lose the benefit of that three-year hold period. So if yeah. you just settled, now in 2015, they, even though they had agreed to put it, like Kevin was saying before, even though they agreed to a value of, say, $12 million, now they can go back, relook at it, and say, no, we think it's now worth $16 million. Now, obviously, the market hasn't changed. And why that disconnect exists, it's, we don't know. It's bureaucracy, I guess. But it will get corrected eventually. It's just a matter of the town's coming around and settling these things. And they, uh, they tend to look at these things as interest-free loans a lot of the time. They know the properties are over-assessed, yeah. but they, they're getting the benefit of those tax dollars, and then when they return it to you, they typically don't do it with interest. Yeah. So. Yeah. Never do it with interest. Right. If all the properties are being re-evaluated, most of them are going to go up. So, which means the tax base is going to go up. So wouldn't the percentage that we're going to be charged have to go down or it would increase the budget? You, well, as, as one goes up, it, it's, it's an inverse relationship. Well, that's what I'm saying. So the percentage would have to go down if our value goes up. Right. Your, your, so your assessed have, value will go up, but your tax, tax rate, will, rate down. will go down. Right. So it but you're still arriving. I mean, well, so you right hope now, that you arrive at the same Right rate. now you might be paying... $800 per thousand dollars of assessment or a thousand dollars per thousand dollars of assessment if you're assessed at full value so right now if your assessment was say five thousand dollars and you're paying a thousand dollars per thousand dollars of assessment your taxes are five thousand dollars if you're all of a sudden you're going to go to, to market value or to hundred percent value so now your assessment is a hundred thousand dollars you're no longer going to be paying a thousand dollars per thousand dollars of assessment you might be paying twenty five dollars per thousand dollars of assessment Keyword there being might, might, right? right. <laughs> Sorry. Which, well, again, that but that goes to what the town board decides. That goes to the town's budget. It, how much they decide they need to operate the town. If they decide they need more, then then everybody's taxes are going to go up. The tax rate's going to go up. That that doesn't mean your assessment is necessarily changing. Uh, but if the town decides that they're going to need less, then you know the tax the actual well, that, dollars that are changed. Well, right, but will the will that almost two percent cap or the Astorino 2% cap factor into this? No. It, that, that's still there, but that just affects how much the town board can increase their budget every year. And there's certain ways that they can finesse that anyway. But. Okay, Daniel, you yeah. said they will go and look at an apartment that's been fully renovated, and maybe see one that hasn't been renovated, it's original. How are they going to equalize the value over, say, 122 unit co-op? Well, that? for, for co-ops, it really, for co-ops, it shouldn't have that kind of effect. It would only have an effect in terms of the, you know, when they're doing the expenses, what they feel would be the repairs, right? I mean, that would be the only thing that it would, that it would really have an effect on. A co-op is not going to be affected by the homestead tax option, so they would still be assessed using the income approach. It's still going to be what Kevin described as going through, you know, he's going to go through and figure out what the um, the market rent would be for an equivalent unit. Um, so it may have an effect because if they go through and they see a new unit, obviously that new co-op unit is going to be able to gain a higher rent than one that is 30 years old and has never been updated. You know, so it, I guess it could have 
an effect from that perspective, but you know, it's not the same type of effect as it would be with a condominium unit that was going to be then changed to the market value approach, where now all of a sudden you know it's it's a little different. Does that make sense? When I when I value them, I try to ascertain um, an average. So. How many of the units do I think have been updated over the last few years? So an update that was done in 1990 doesn't really matter. It's, you're comparing, you know, so it's only in the last five to ten years that really it's going to drastically affect the uh, the potential rental value of that unit. So when they give all of these valuations, are they going to send it to a property manager? Who are they going to send this information to in a co-op? You said the individual apartment owner will not receive that. Well, yeah, I don't, they're not, in other words, I don't think they're going to send the data mailers for each individual apartment unit. They're going to, with co-ops, they're going to want to get information from the, the managing agents as far as, like they would in a certiorari, as far as how many rentals are there, if there are any, you know, what the, in, you know, what your income is, what your expenses are, um, the, you know, I mean, they're probably, they're, if they don't have the offering plan, they're going to want the offering plan, they, you know, in a lot of cases they already have it, but... Um, you know, they're going to want the information. That's really what they're going to want. Then they're going to come around. They're going to want to get into the apartment so they can see, you know, if one has been updated and if it's been, you know, renovated or if they added a half bathroom, you know, whatever it is, that something that would change the value that would make it so that instead of that apartment renting for $1,200 a month, now that apartment would rent on the open market for $1,700 a month. You know, that would affect the calculation that, that Kevin does, but that's... <laughs> is there a slippery slope with with the cooperatives following condominiums at some point and losing the income evaluation and going to residential? Could we expect that? I mean, it's an excellent question. It's something that comes up like probably every other year in Albany. That's something that would have to be decided in Albany. That's not something that the town could decide. Um, that That's a state issue. It is something that comes up like every other year. And we, we always track it, and every time it comes up that it looks like it has legs, we always send around to the, all the co-ops that we know of in the community. We try to get people to, to write letters to their state senators, state assembly people, and, you know, and, and voice their displeasure at the proposed law. It's been suggested or proposed in, in different forms over the years, always aimed at kind of you know, chipping away at that. Um, and we always do try to fight it. Um, this particular law, the homestead tax option, has been in place since I think like 1980 or something. I mean, a really long time. Yeah, I'm not so sure it's exactly not when. specifically new in that respect. Um, but yeah, they're. I mean, they. You know, Albany is always trying to chip away at, you know, at that, and they always want to change it and have co-ops and condos tax like single-family home on, homes. Um, you know, they always do it, and we always try to fight it. And fortunately, to this point, we've been successful, and we keep our fingers crossed that. You know, it won't change. As long as you're actively protecting that that tax benefit, I, I would it would seem hard hard to believe that it would ever pass uh, on the state level, just because there's so many there's so many. You're not even talking about just Westchester County. It's also New York City and all the five boroughs and Long Island. Yeah, I mean, there's th hundreds of thousands of voters that would be very upset. If that were ever eliminated, so a lot of lawmakers would lose their jobs, I'm sure. So. <laughs> and that's what they're always concerned about, isn't it? So. Is there any other questions? Yeah, I'm, from what you're saying, I don't think this is the case. But do bank appraisals for mortgages play into this in any way? Not at all. No, uh, it's completely separate from that. Um, again, it's it's valuing it according to that real property tax law. Now, there's an interesting phenomenon where you bought your unit, say you bought your unit for $500,000, and you, when you bought your unit, you assumed your tax obligation would be what it's always been, say $8,000 growing a little bit every year, right? If they go to this homestead option, and all of a sudden, just like he said, all of a sudden your taxes go up to twelve or thirteen or 14000 you're that's going to erode the value of your condominium like instantly because, like he said, we all have a certain amount of money that we can pay towards housing, right? And how it's broken up, no one 
it doesn't matter really what goes to taxes, what goes to my mortgage. I just know the monthly obligation that I can afford. And when more of that is going to the government, less of it is going towards my mortgage, which means I can afford less, which that's, that's the problem. And just to, just to give an example from Mamaroneck, when they were considering uh, Homestead, Mamaroneck ultimately decided not to adopt Homestead. Uh, but when they were considering it, they, they did a public hearing, they did a presentation, and they compared what they showed for an average unit, an average condominium unit in Mamaroneck, what it would be, what the taxable value would be under, uh, under non-Homestead, it would have been 299000 and if they adopted Homestead, the value would go up to f over 500000 and that would translate to a tax increase under the non-homestead after the revaluation from 6,800 to a little over 6,800 to up to about 11,400. So that, you know, that was Marinick's numbers. I don't know, again. Like and there's no said, saying that that, that great, number that they are applying is correct. Just because they're doing a reval, right. it doesn't, believe me, I've seen some of the worksheets that the Marinick uh, company came up with their values with and it, it's not tied to reality of what I do at all. It's, they're, they do everything on a mass basis, so they, they're not looking in the individual attributes of the units. They're saying, well, the per square foot rental value is uh, uh, 35 bucks a foot, where some maybe it's 22 bucks a foot, some maybe it's 45 bucks a foot, you know, but they're not looking at the individual units. And then instead of actually looking at the actual expenses incurred, which are, it's clear that those expenses are what it takes to operate that, that property. Instead of looking at that, they just look at it as a percentage of income. So rather than looking at the actual expenses incurred, they say, well, the, ex the operating expenses should be about 20% of gross income, where I can tell you it's usually over 40% for these things. But it's their, inf it's their information. It's the their. The decision is being made upon. Mm -hmm. okay. How many towns have adopted the Homestead Act? Well, in Westchester County, or um, Westchester County, I only know of Rye. Well, Rye and Pelham. Pelham. I, I didn't Rye know Pelham, Pelham so long ago. I mean, all right, so yeah, Rye Pelham, I think, was up for it. Pelham was not, was one of the first in Westchester yeah, County. They Pelham were ninety eight. It was ninety eight. I think it was ninety eight okay. when they first did it. They I don't. They might not have adopted Homestead then, but I think they're. They Rye did it. Rye did it in 06, I believe, yeah. for the 06 role. And so far, Austin has recently. Not adopted it. Well, Ossining is still undergoing the process. They're undergoing it right now along with Greenberg. They they had an interesting thing where they had there was a lot of uproar about it. They got citizens got very concerned about Homestead. So the town board came out and said, Oh, we're not gonna do it and then not realizing that they can't make the decision yet because they don't even have yeah. any of the numbers yet. So like the supervisor and the town board yeah. all are had a non binding resolution. Okay, so this won't happen until the revaluation re is completed. The, the, right. the issue of whether they adopt Homestead or not, yeah. correct. They're going to they're gonna vote on that. I, I, it's somewhere February, March, maybe April. I mean, they don't have the exact date yet, but they'll have all the numbers from this process by, like, January of 2016. They'll then do a public, at least probably at least one public hearing, depending on how seriously they're considering it, maybe more than that, but then they'll vote on it, like I said, February, March, April, something like that. And, and, as, and as soon as we know when they're going to vote on that and when that's going to come up, we will certainly be sending around emails to everybody, and, and probably even before then, because probably in the fall sometime, we'll, we'll start getting everybody motivated to like an email campaign, you know, whatever, and have everybody start even at that point to express to the town board that they do not wish to have this considered. Um, so that way when they are considering it, they'll already know how many people are against it. Yeah, that's specifically what. I mean, it's so complex. It looks like it would take we, an expert to do that. Well, that's one of the things. I mean, that's what basically do. what Kevin does. He does the appraisals for exactly that. That's what he does. Um, and that's and a part of you know big part of my practice also is you know not only do we represent um, a lot of cooperatives and condominiums, um, you know, for as general counsel, but for many of them, we do their tax certiorari work as well. That's what I do basically all day long is <laughs> try to correct these things. Um, and, you know, a lot of times it takes numerous years just because there's such a backlog in the courts. So any assessments they apply 
in this first year, number one, I can almost guarantee you they're not going to be accurate. And number two, it's probably going to take two or three years to resolve. Just because they're the town, if they're anything like Mamaroneck, they're going to refuse to acknowledge that they made mistakes. And it just takes someone, it takes several guys like me basically proving that they overvalued these properties for them to finally come around. So. Well, I mean, I usually get paid on a contingency. So for the years that we file, if we get a refund for you, then we would get a percentage of that refund. Um, Kevin is more. Yeah, we well, we we're, we're bound by something called USPAP. So what I would do is I would send someone like Daniel a fee quote and say, okay, so now there's one year at issue. I'm going to prepare my analysis. The first year would say cost. $2,000, and I would, it, it depends on numerous things, Num one being how large the property is. So that, that really determines how much uh, research I have to do. So if you're talking about 250 units with, you know, 45 different unit types, that's a lot of research that I have to do to try to establish what market level rents are. Um, so, but in, in this example, there was only 13 units, and they're all very similar. I mean, they vary in size, but they were all generally pretty similar. So this, this was a lower cost analysis that I had done just because it was, uh, there's so few things. The more, the more there is, the more complicated it gets, basically, the more units there are. Is there anything that you could um, suggest that would help with the inspections and the data numbers to try to help them get it right in the first place? It would, be, you'd think, you'd think that they would really consider the information that there would be someone really reading all that stuff that, that that they're asking to receive. But take yourself and multiply it by how many parcels are in the town of Greenberg, twenty thousand, or whatever, yeah, it is. thousands and thousands of people. It's a lot of information to process, and uh, Tyler Technologies probably has a whole team working on this, but nowhere near enough to sort through the information that they're provided. I mean, even if they what have, they do is they, have 20 they get your information and they try to digitize it. And, you know, they're not actually reviewing every single sheet. I mean, you know, just, again, when you, get the, when you get the results back, the data mailer where they're telling you, you know, what information they have about your unit or your co-op or whatever, just make sure you review it very carefully. Make sure that it's as accurate as as you know you can possibly make it, and return it to them. And they will, you know, they will either update their numbers or they'll call you or they'll come out for another inspection. They, they, you know, they will double check it. They're not gonna, you know, if you write on it and, and tell them, they're not gonna ignore that. Not really. I would think the inspection would be something you'd want to talk to your immediate neighbors about and just make sure everyone's on board and that they all want to show their units to Tyler Technologies. Because um, the more they know about your unit, the more they can use it against you kind of thing. You know, so they're going to see a stainless, stainless appliances and immediately, oh, well, that one's going to rent for more. You know what I mean? So if it, you might, it might be smart to, to let them air on without giving them too if much If you have the 13 units that, that Kevin alluded to, if you have that 13 unit building and every one of the units is brand new, you know, brand new, brand new appliances, you know, high-end tiles and carpet, you know, the works, I mean, I'm not sure what benefit it is to any of you showing them, but once one of you shows them the apartment, then, you know, they extrapolate then it doesn't really that. matter. Yeah, they're going to extrapolate. But yeah. so that's, I think that's Kevin's point. You know, make sure that you're all on board. If you all have brand new units, you know. Uh, any other questions? Um, how much notice? They, it, it should be a reason. I mean, it's you know they're not going to notify you the next day, but it should be a couple weeks. The sample I got was um, they sent a notice around to the person that gave it to me on 
uh, May 14th, and they asked that um, they asked that the person call them within 10 days so they could schedule an appointment. Th they'll think, work with you to try to schedule it. That was a condo. Yeah, this was from somebody. I think it's kind of like the cable guy. Like they give you a window, and then they show up late. They they do have they do actually have Saturday appointments. Um, I mean, at least according to their website. So for anybody that does want to show their apartment. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.